Hi, I'm Clyde Kusatsu. I play Vice Admiral Nakamura on Star Trek Next Generation, and you are listening to Trek Untold. Hello and welcome back to Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I'm your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. This show has always been about highlighting the unsung heroes who are part of the always expanding Star Trek universe. But just as much as it's about Star Trek, any regular fans know that it's always about much more than that. After all, whether it's an actor or a director or a stunt performer or behind the scenes person, Star Trek is only one piece of their life and career. In the case of this week's guest, it's a tiny footnote on their resume, but the rest of that resume is impressive beyond belief. And no, I'm not talking about Jonathan Frakes. And if you don't get that reference, you didn't grow up during the 90s. Today, we're chatting with Clyde Kasatsu, a veteran actor who has appeared in over 300 roles on TV series and films. You may remember him from his three appearances on Star Trek The Next Generation as Admiral Nakamura first appearing in the second season episode Measure of a Man, and then returning in season 7 for Phantasms and the series finale All Good Things. Beyond Trek, you know him from roles on Hawaii Five-0, Magnum P.I., All-American Girl, MacGyver, Family Matters, Bring Him Back Alive, Quincy, General Hospital, The Young and the Restless, along with a ton of voiceover roles in series like The Smurfs, a bunch of Scooby-Doo shows, The Real Ghostbusters, Avatar The Last Airbender, and The Legend of Korra, and so many more that Obviously, if I rattled off all 300 of those, that's basically a whole show in itself. However, as I kind of started to allude to at the start of this show here, this episode of Trek Untold barely mentions Star Trek, and that's the reason why this interview is being spread out into two different parts. Clyde is a performer with hundreds of roles, as we just mentioned, and I wanted to really take advantage of this opportunity with someone whose work I've always admired to really kind of go down as much of his resume as possible. Little did I know, Clyde would not only oblige, but he would give me way more stories than I ever expected, along with a lot of professional and life advice along the way. And the fun thing about all of his stories is that because he's worked so much throughout his life, everything is connected to one another. So while well, I get one story, that then sections off into three others, and they're all really fun and really exciting to listen to. So this week, we're mainly focusing on Clyde's work in the 70s, as well as a little tiny piece of the 80s and an even smaller part of the 90s. But there's really not much Trek talk beyond a little bit of discussion of Nicholas Meyer towards the end of this episode. However, what you are going to get in this episode is some stories about his five appearances on the original Kung Fu series with David Carradine, working on Midway with Toshiro Mifuni, being in the original Doctor Strange, his appearances on All in the Family, Paradise Road, and much more. Personally, I regret not doing more two-parters in this show, and I feel like certain episodes would have definitely been great to have that, such as my interviews with Ron Canada and, more recently, Patricia Tallman. So consider this pair of episodes one part experiment in my format, and one part experiment in how listeners and audience members like you enjoy interviews done in this two-part style. It won't be a regular occurrence, but sometimes a guest just has so much meat on the bones that we need a bigger plate, or in this case, a second helping. So let's get to know the life and times of one of the busiest working men in Hollywood, and I say that because he's still working today, Mr. Clyde Kasatsu. But before we begin this week's episode, if you'd like to support this show, please don't forget to follow Trek Untold on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to get the latest updates and all sorts of other fun Star Trek-related content. You can also check us out on Patreon at patreon.com slash trekuntold, where you can support this show for as little as $2 a month. At higher tiers, you can check out the shows before they come out, know about my guests in advance, and even have a chance to ask them questions, among other benefits coming soon. Shout out to our sponsor, Triple Fiction Productions, who create 3D printed toys and prop replicas inspired by Star Trek. Their items come in all shapes and all sizes and are always amazing, but you're going to hear a little bit more about them later on in the show. If you're listening to us on iTunes or any other audio platform that allows for ratings and reviews, please leave us a five-star rating and a positive review. If you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to us at youtube.com slash nerdnewstoday and give the video a thumbs up and a comment. Doing any of those things help keep this show growing and allow me to continue bringing you awesome guests and great conversations every single week. Now, without further ado, let's beam in this week's guest. Computer, access interview file. 
And welcome back to Trek Untold, and you guys already heard the giant list of accolades and shows that our guest has been in. I'm not going to go over it again, because we have so much to discuss here again, but we've got now joining us today a true pioneer for Asian American actors, a real trailblazer, and someone who I've been watching since I was a kid. So today we're joined by Mr. Clyde Kasatsu. Clyde, how are you today? Hi, I'm fine. Uh, thank you very much, Matthew. At least it's dry. It's not raining in California right now, so that's good. <laughs> well, I'm here in New York and I'm freezing my butt off, so I'm jealous of where you are. Oh, are you in the city or in the state? I'm in the city. Ah, yeah, you're kind of sort of quasi locked down right now, huh? <laughs> kind of, sort of. It feels like we're perpetually locked down these days. Um, but you know, I was just telling you before we came on air how I've been basically watching you since I was a kid, and I can remember you very specifically since I was a little kid, seeing your face, and uh, oh. I'm just so excited to be able to talk with you today. And, you know, obviously, uh, we mentioned you've been in over 300 things, TV, film. Uh, right. Star Trek is truly a blip on the radar. So I'm very excited to be able to pick your brain about some of the other stuff you've done today, because, again, there's so much. I'm going nuts already here. So let's just jump right <laughs> on in, Clyde. I'd like to ask you the first thing I ask all my guests, and that's sure. what's your earliest memory of Star Trek? Oh, the earliest memory is definitely 1966 fall. 1966, I was a freshman at Northwestern University just beginning uh, my uh, major in theater in the uh, Northwestern department, theater department. But it was this thing that popped up and we used to go to the fraternity house to watch it because that's where they had the big TV, color TV set. And everybody was like, hush, it's, you know, and everybody was like anticipating it. And it was um, truly the thing that kind of bonded everyone together, you know, it was so unique. And it was one of those things that uh, you saw a whole different uh, color palette on the screen, aside from the, the color itself, but in the characters, like Michelle McCall uh, playing uh, Lieutenant Uhura, George, George Kane plays Sulu, and uh, utilizing, uh, you know, uh, Walter Koenig as uh, Chekhov. And, and it just brought a different kind of perspective to what it, the possibilities were for especially um, a young actor of, uh, well, back in the, the day, it was a uh, Oriental, but then it changed to Asian. But now it's person of color, POC or POC or whatever. And so, but um, it it was one of those kind of affirming shows to watch. And, and it was when they canceled it, it was like, what? You know, you just couldn't believe it. You know, it was just, why? I mean, well, how could they do that? And that's during those days when you find out the economics of it all, you just go, well, you scratch your head because these days, if there's any nut or little um, audience core growing, no, they're they're going to stick with it, you know? Very cool. You know, it's a story we've heard a lot from many of the guests on the show here, how they basically seeing themselves in the cast of a Star Trek, that's kind of what got them interested in acting, or even if it didn't happen just at that point in their life, uh, it's something that, you know, stuck with them and made them feel like they're actually part of society, I guess. It's, it's a weird way to say it, but it made them feel valued and feel like they're actually part of something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the same when um, Star Wars hit the zeitgeist you know i mean it was like 1975 was 75 or 76 no 76 we were shooting uh the choir boys uh robert aldridge was the director and jimmy woods was going hey man we gotta go see star wars it's tour star wars what the what the hell is that you know and it was it was just one of those things where i think there was a article in time magazine at the, at the time uh touting star wars and everything and so we wrapped early and uh, Jimmy said, look, I got a buddy. Um, he'll save us a, a place in line and he'll get the tickets. So let's go to Westwood. Meanwhile, we'll, we'll go to the bar, have a few drinks. And so I said, OK, fine. And then it was boom. There was a it was in Westwood and there was a line of people. I said, wait, this line is incredible. And don't worry about, it. you know, Jimmy Woods is one of these kind of uh, uh, force of nature personalities, you know. So all of a sudden we're walking along, we're just hanging around. He goes, go! And we cut into the line. I said, you're afraid you're going to get killed, you know? And then we're preparing for it. And then it happened so quick, I guess. All of a sudden there are people already dressed in certain uh, paraphernalia and costumes. Like this was like going to be their 10th viewing of the damn show, you know? But then when it hit, you know, dun, 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 going back with the whole thing the, with the uh, crawl of the story and everything. And it was like, wow, that that's like, this is going to really be something, you know, and it, it got kind of big, but then the middle section, and we, that was like 
four, five, and six, right? And then they went back to one, two, and three episodes uh, after the Ewoks. And it was like, I, I, I couldn't watch those. It was like, what, who, where, why? Uh, it, it just didn't connect until they relaunched it again. And then it was like, ah, they recapture, recaptured the magic of it all. And uh, it was an ex- it, it is an exciting adventure. Yeah, we don't we don't talk about the prequels here in this podcast. Those don't exist. One, two, and three never happened. <laughs> well, the thing about it is, you know, it's like the Mandalorian is like really choice, and uh, I didn't get it. There's so much stuff I didn't get a chance to watch the second season of the Mandalorian, but I I was on location in Australia just uh, in November this past November. And you have to do a 14 day quarantine in Australia. So you're in this one room. Granted, it's got carpeting, it's a nice bed, and it was a view of the Brisbane River and everything, but there's no human contact, you know. But you just make sure that you have your Disney Plus app on your computer <laughs> or your iPad. And I was able to binge the whole season and, of course, see. Baba Fett coming up again and and saying, oh, this is where Ming Na Wen showed up then, you know, because Ming, Ming and I worked, she was a, a guest on an episode of All American Girl that uh, we did 25 years ago. And, uh, and of course, she went to ER and everything like that. But I thought, how cool is that to be connected, especially after the Avengers to, uh, no, no, uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., to be connected to something that's going to be much more lasting, I believe, in that universe, you know? So it's like, uh, oh, of course, also what's impressive about the Mandalorian is the technology that has been able to be used. When I first saw the first show of it, I went, wow, a budget for a half hour? They went to Morocco? And of course, I've learned since that, you know, you're dealing with uh, LED digital panels, which replaced the green screen. The the technology is just so awesome. As an actor, you're on a set and you are are actually responding and acting to like the spaceship or to the the desert and everything like that because of the screen just fills it all up. And there's like a there's no difference between the reality and uh, where where the the LEDs take over. And uh, so it, it hooked me from the beginning. And the fact that I'm wondering how Pedro Pascal does it all the time with that mask on how can he move much less see where the hell he's going without bumping into something you know it's an it's an exciting time and um god willing maybe i'll get cast in one of those things it'll be fun to do you know i hope so i mean i know you just were in the uh hit monkey series so you are at least within the marvel universe now which monkey what what series uh hit monkey hit monkey what's that i i think he did a voice over that didn't you uh, you know I, i've been doing stuff that i don't <laughs> Um, I can't connect to it, but if you say so, you know, because I did, um, I just did uh, about four or five episodes of a thing called Blue Eyed Samurai for Netflix. Hasn't been released yet. Yeah, it's not out yet. A, a thing called Phaeton that's uh, like a two year thing that they're still working on for AMC. Plus. It's like an alternate universe. And I did about six of them as a, a creature that lives in cyber, cyber world or whatever. We're attempting to destroy the world. But well, that's Phaeton, F-P-H-A-T-O-N. And um, see, uh, Blue Eyes Samurai is played by, um, uh, what's this? Uh, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at age thing where trying to connect with the neurons in the brain just goes, I mean, he played, I played his grandfather uh, um, in um, Never Have I Ever, just last season. He plays my grandson. This is embarrassing. But um, that's why we have Google, I suppose, to take a look at it. But let's move on anyway. So it's like, and right now, I, I guess uh, there's a little trend going on with people are discovering that I was the original Wong in uh, Doctor Strange in 1978, which we did for CBS as a two-hour movie and potential uh, potential pilot for a series. But then I think we kind of got crashed when we were aired opposite roots that kind of like blew it out of the water type of thing. But it's always good to be one of the first, you know, one of the originals. Yeah, you really can't beat Roots, unfortunately, going head-to-head against Roots. That's basically a suicide mission. So 
You know, but hey, at least you were part of the Marvel Universe before there was a Marvel Universe. That's pretty cool. Well, Stan, uh, Stan Lee really loved the show. And uh, Phil DeGear uh, was really uh, a big uh, advocate of it. And for 1978, we put a, spent a lot of bucks uh, into the thing, even trying to, but the, the technology wasn't there, you know, as far as uh, green screen and everything like that. So it, it kind of has a different kind of, it kind of has a camp, more campy feel to it now. Uh, but the idea was there, you know. So, but it, it was a fun thing to do with, uh, especially playing Wong uh, to uh, Sir John Mills is uh, uh, the wizard or Merlin is his name or the, um, the teacher for- Sorcerer uh, Supreme. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> for Stephen Strange, you know. But it was a great um, opportunity to uh, kind of change it up and not play Wong as a real stereotypic character with uh, exotic robes and everything but make him like uh you know very cool english gentleman with a three-piece suit and doing the business and stuff with as much powers as be but not the as many powers as the supreme one you know so clyde i'd like to get a little bit of uh, background information about you uh, i'd love to find out you know a little bit about your childhood so can you tell us uh where you were born what your parents did oh. and what little clyde wanted to be when he grew up uh -huh. um i was born and raised in honolulu hawaii so, um, I, I, and so I grew up in the fifties and, uh, in the fifties, it was still, um, the transition from Hawaii plantation society and to you know, agriculture to the modern world, you know, the tourism hit and everything like that. But as a kid, I was really a lover of TV. They started off with one TV station called KGMB, which was CBS affiliate. Then as they got each new station opened up, ABC or NBC, to fill the time, they, they, put, they aired all the musical, I mean, uh, film libraries, Warner Brothers, MGM, Universal. I'm just, I mean, basically, I grew up with Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland saying, hey, let's make a show. Let's go get this barn. Let's get this thing, put a bale of hay, and uh, let's perform. And that, that magic of performing just captured me. And as a kid, I mean, I remember going up to my folks saying, uh, can I take tap dancing lessons? And they looked at me like I was some kind of a creature. And who are you kind of a thing? And uh, they thought it was a passing fancy. But when I was four, I, I, and like when in seventh grade, I was at a school called Iolani, which was an all boys Episcopal males uh, prep school at the time in Honolulu. It's now co-ed. But I got involved in music, of course, band and then the choir. And uh, they were having shows. And of course, I was too shy to audition uh, for those things. But my choir teacher felt I had a great voice. And um, she invited me. She says, how would you like to be part of the chorus of Guys and Dolls? I was 14 at the time because somebody dropped out. And in, when we do these musicals in Hawaii at the time, they would have girls from Punahou, which was co-ed, and uh, St. Andrew's Priory, which was Episcopal Girls School. And so it was the first time you got to mix with girls. And it was like a totally different world. You know, all of a sudden it's the world of theater. And I'm going, this is magic time, man. I mean, I, this is what I want to do. And I found that I could do it. Whereas when doing athletics, uh, I mean, it was an effort to do a mile, you know, four times around the track without heaving my guts out. And But then um, I could follow the dance moves being shown by the choreographer and everything and perform and, and sing, dance, and put it all together. And so it was, um, that was the dream. And then when I was, I had applied to Northwestern and I got in. And that summer of 66 um, was a summer when uh, this producer named Herb Rogers brought professional theater, summer stock theater to Honolulu by forming the Hawaii Civic Light Opera. And their third show was The King and I starring Anne Blythe, who was a former contract player at MGM and a New York actor. And so it was like New York actors, Hollywood actors doing a season of summer stock. And I got cast as the crown prince. Uh, and it was life-changing. And I wound up, one, life-changing because I could quit dull pineapple cannery summer job and uh, do that show. And uh, then later on, they uh, invited me to stay on as an apprentice for the rest of the season. So I got to know people like uh, Howard Keel and uh, who became really second career with Dallas. 
after Jim Davis had passed on. And then um, the interesting thing about it is, is that I thought I was really hot shit, you know, going up, I worked all this thing in summer stock and then freshman year, there were all these theater majors that have, they did summer internships. They were apprentices up in New England and Maine and in Pennsylvania, or whatever. And they had so much more. In my freshman year, I was uh, confronted by, uh, oh, no, I'll say it this way. I was approached by one of the professors who said, uh, why do I, uh, why do you want to be th- by an actor? I mean, there's only Tiance of the August Moon and King and I, how could you possibly make a living at this? Which was soul crushing, you know, it was like, I didn't have an answer. I mean, except like, because I want to do it. Why not? Yeah, if I could sure. just yeah. interject too, um, you know, I, I'd heard that you were actually the only person of color at Northwestern at the time you were attending. Is that true? Oh, yes, I was. Yeah, I think, yeah, by the time I was a senior, maybe there was a, a, a couple of uh, Black students at the time participating. And, and I do remember one freshman said he wanted to quit. But then he said to a friend that, well, if Clyde can do it, well, I'm going to stick with it, you know. And so it was like, I mean, I had the reality. I knew I knew what it was, Um, but there's there was no place to plant a flag or climb a battlement or talk about uh, reciprocity and this and that. You know, it's just that after that professor said that I went home to Hawaii and worked the night shift at Primo Brewery. Uh, from four, Primo Beer no longer exists anymore, except in the memory bank. But doing that, I said, well, if I got to work 10 times harder than a white actor just to get noticed, that's going to have to do. And so to make a long story short, I went back and I, I auditioned for everything from directing scenes to studio theater to children's theater. So by the time I did graduate three years later, I was considered a working member uh, actor within the theater department of Northwestern, half the professors would cast me, half wouldn't, but would hold me up as an example of a working actor within the university situation. And in the summers, I would find myself cast, uh, apply and, and audition for summer stock in Michigan City, Indiana, Grand Lake, Colorado, Aspen, Colorado. Uh, granted, we weren't paid a lot, you know, 25 bucks a week, free room and board or $50 a week. But if you were the stage manager, you get an extra 25 when we opened this theater in Michigan City called the Canterbury Playhouse, which I think still is open. I mean, we we did the inaugural opening in 1969. Uh, but at, at any rate, um, so you do that for the experience. And in all my years of performing until I came to uh, Hollywood and Los Angeles, when all of a sudden I was Oriental and Asian, I had played um, non-ND roles and uh, white roles uh, with just that I'm in Asia playing. It did, so it does work. People would say, you look, it looked kind of funny that you're there. But after a while, we got used to it and it was believable. It works. I mean, it works now. Look at Bridgerton and stuff like that. People are not questioning it too much anymore, but it takes time. So I, had, I, I uh, wound up in LA in 1971 and um, got my equity card uh, working at Inner City Cultural Center, which was a multicultural, multiracial theater, the idea of that. And then uh, a year later, I wound up doing a, a play called The Gold Watch that starred Mako, a great actor who was nominated for Academy Award for the Sand Pebbles. And he was uh, one of the founders of an uh, Asian American theater company called the East West Players, which is now in its almost in its I think it's been over 50 years since it was founded. But at the time, our mission was to show uh, Hollywood or casting in L.A. that what's wrong with uh, just having, you know, a alternate kind of casting going on. So we do things like Three Sisters by Chekhov or Ibsen's, you know, plays and this and that. In fact, we had a production of one year we had a production of Three Sisters. Or we're, we were the fourth production. One was at the Center Theater, the big theater in L.A., and a couple of other places. But the critics loved our production. We, they thought we was really good. And it was a time when casting uh, directors and writers and directors and producers would go to theater to, to 
to scout and look for for talent and everything. And I also utilized that opportunity to continue studying and also going back to the my Asian roots and doing plays that were Japanese centric or Chinese centric or everything, understanding the, the difference of movement, how to wear the costumes, the kimono, the hakama, the whole thing. And all the things you do just helps you later on when you find yourself cast in a different situation. I'm, I'm a firm believer that when you uh, do a project, you do as much research as possible so that um, a lot of times it's not just the dialogue that you have to say, it's how you inhabit the character. Are you comfortable wearing that uniform? Are you believable within that cultural setting? And on and on and on. So, I mean, at one point, um, I was um, one of my first films that I was cast in was Midway, which is that great battle of Midway thing. And Toshiro Mifune played Admiral Yamamoto, and I was cast as Commander Watanabe, his real life aide. And I did, uh, I tried to find as much info, but all it said was Commander Watanabe was Admiral Yamamoto's aide. So I wound up uh, reading uh, several books. One of them was called uh, uh, Samurai by, it was the life story of Saburo Sakai, who at that time was the oldest living surviving uh, ace and um, who described the training that went in and why in the military terms in Japan, the Imperial Army and the Navy, the order of uh, the chain of command was, if I was a captain, I could bash the lieutenant, the lieutenant could bash the sergeant, the sergeant could slap and bash the private, and the private is going, wait, you're not supposed to surrender, so you're not even a human if you surrendered, so they'd bash the prisoners or whatever. And then also in the, in the Navy, it was patterned more after the Dutch and the British, so their traditions were more Western. And then there was another um, book called Destroyer Captain, which talked about going to the academy called Itajima, which was an island in Hiroshima Bay, like uh, Annapolis. But those are the things I read. So then when I did put on that uniform and um, do the scenes, it was believable for myself and for the project itself. And um, that was one of the, that was first of two roles I got to work with Toshiro Mifune, who was the icon of uh, Japanese cinema. Trek Untold will return momentarily. Trek Untold is brought to you by Triple Fiction Productions. Triple Fiction Productions produces affordable and unique 3D printed Trek inspired products from the original series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, and the movies. Ranging from prop replicas to use in a fan film or cosplay, to accessories or playsets for figures in all different sizes, Triple Fiction Productions has got you covered. Past pieces for toys have included large centerpieces like 10 Forward from the Enterprise D, shuttlecrafts complete with working lights, and the Voyager Bridge, with smaller pieces including Borg alcoves, the Genesis device, and the dreaded arch enemy of Worf, barrels. All highly detailed products are 3D printed and hand painted in the USA, with new items added all the time, while simultaneously improving their printing quality based on fan feedback. To learn more about their products, visit triple-fictionproductions.net or visit them on Facebook at facebook.com slash triplefictionproductions. Want to get 10% off your next purchase? Use code UNTOLD10 at checkout to receive this discount not applicable during sales or clearance events. That's code UNTOLD10 to get 10% off action figure dioramas, accessories, and prop replicas. Triple Fiction Productions, taking Star Trek where no 3D printer has gone before. Hi, I'm Armin Schimmerman. And I'm Kitty Swink. 17 years ago, I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. I didn't know it at the time, but I had a 4% chance of surviving five years. As her husband, I was very scared. But he never let me see that. You are a rock. Thank you. Thank you. Pancreatic cancer is the third leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the United States, with a five-year survival rate of just 10%. We want it to be much higher. Much higher. It's 6% better when I was diagnosed, but not high enough. More than 60,000 Americans are estimated to be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 2021, and more than 48,000 will die from the disease. Because symptoms are often vague, it can be hard to detect. Like the rest of the world, the Star Trek universe has been struck repeatedly by pancreatic cancer. 
not only those of us that work on the show, but our fans around the world as well. It is why we came together with so many others to work with the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, the leading patient advocates committed to fighting the world's toughest cancer. PANCAN is working hard to create better outcomes for this devastating disease through its groundbreaking research and early detection and better treatment options. PANCAN drives progress by funding life-saving research, providing personalized patient services, and creating a community of supporters and volunteers who will stop at nothing to create a world in which all pancreatic cancer patients will thrive. You can help support their important mission by donating at pancan.org today. We donated, won't you do so too? Please, make it so. We now return to Truck Untold. I actually wanted to ask you about Toshiro, in fact, because uh, my my knowledge of really, I guess, classic cinema begins with the Kira Kurosawa films. And of course, my very first film I saw was Seven Samurai, and it's still one of my favorites oh, to yeah, this day. Yeah. So I, I love anything Toshiro's in. I, I can watch Yojimbo any time of the day and just watch the whole thing and enjoy it. Yeah, um, Yojimbo, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you got the motions down. You've got the arm crossed, too. Um, but I'd love to actually ask about how Toshiro was off camera. I mean, did you get a chance to really talk to him and pick his brain, learn from him? Um, it's very difficult because his English wasn't that good. Or he would pretend that he didn't speak English and would always be dependent on his uh, translator. And his translator was uh, and assistant was Miko Taka, who was uh, famous as a lead in Sayonara with uh, Marlon Brando years before. And but at any rate, um, Tashira was the the embodiment of, of knowledge when we first met to do the scene, which became the opening of the movie Midway, where I'm driven up and I rushed down to inform the Admiral that uh, Tokyo was bombed by uh, uh, Doolittle and the Raiders. Uh, he noticed something, he took off his own ceremonial officer's dagger to make sure I wore it, that I as an aide would definitely have it. And um, I remember as I'd get the rewrites, the pinks, the blues, all of a sudden my dialogue started to increase so that when the finally time to shoot, it became his lines were like, when, how did they do it? And I'm going, well, they want da, 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 da. So years later, there was a project that uh, John Frankenheimer directed called The Equals, but it's now called The Challenge uh, with uh, Toshiro Mifune and Scott Glenn, which uh, we shot in Japan. And I replaced somebody and when I um, got there, it was to play to Shiro Bufuni's character, um, the right-hand man, who was the one says, well, Rick, what Sensei Yoshida says is this. And um, that's where having the knowledge and training of, of wearing uh, and being comfortable in Japanese garb was a real plus because the Japanese Japanese would be watching to see you fuck up. <laughs> he said, oh, no, 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 that's just an American. He didn't know nothing. Because I know as much as anything is disrespectful to try to pretend unless you've done some studying about that. And so as the time went on, they were like, oh, he, he knows how to do it. He knows. I just had one word. I said, sambol. And like three arrows would fall on the ground and everybody went, that's great. Nice, nice, nice. And it was a great opportunity. And then years later, and in Mifune, it's interesting, the American camera crew would, every time uh, lunch came around, they'd jump in a car and go find a restaurant. But Mifune, Toshiro Mifune invited myself and a couple of other the leads to have lunch with him and his driver provided. And his sometime, at that time, his girlfriend was there who is pregnant. And uh, it was all very um, uh, hosp hospitable. And then years later, I get a call saying, um, they're requesting an interview for a, a show from NHK TV. And it turns out the host was Mika Mifune, the daughter who was already pregnant in the, you know, uh, with her mom pregnant. And so I, I got all these pictures that I, I had from uh, Midway to present to her that she hadn't seen. And then she said, you know, my father always talked about you, about how good it was to work with you and how much you taught him English. And I went, wow, wow, really? I mean, it was one of those Years later, when you find it out, it's like you, you wanted to run out going, hey, this is what the sheriff when he said, you know, but but now it's sort of where I'm at a place where at least I can share with you, for example, that little 
little story, that little anecdote and everything. And the point being is that you never know when things will happen, right? It's, it's all kind of, the, 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 the life is like the journey. In the journey, you can't, you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. And if you never know what may happen and how many interconnectedness there are or how many paths diverge, converge, and you never know when. And if you try to make it happen, it's like a fool's errand to do it. So it's that's an example of it. And and John Frankenheimer made sure that he could, um, with uh, Toshiro's help, Mifune-san's help, get as many of uh, the Seventh Samurai alumni to be in the movie. So in the ch in, in the challenge, we have Shimada as a as his father. We have Inaba, the large fella, and we have Se we had uh, Seiji Miyaguchi, who was the swordsman in the you know. And Seiji was a tiny guy in comparison, you know, and he had to learn how to open the sword again. And I went, really? But so this is where the connectedness come in. So that was 81. Then in 80, then in 96, I got cast uh, in a Bruce Beresford uh, film called Paradise Road, which was based on a true story of um, a British, uh, Australian, Dutch and American women that were captured by the Japanese in uh, the Dutch East Indies or Indonesia today. So I'm playing one of the main characters who's a sergeant. Um, and the I, I was introduced, I know the technical advisor and dialogue coach uh, introduced himself to me and his name. And he, I was saying, oh, and his name was Tomo Miyaguchi. And I was telling him the story a bit about the challenge. And then he stopped me and said, Seiji Miyaguchi is my father. <laughs> so years later, I'm, working with Seiji Miyaguchi's son, who lives, in, who lives in Brisbane, who's been technical advisor from the Thin Red Line, all and all these, uh, the Railroad Man, all these different films that deal with the Pacific and everything. And so it was a great help. And in, in many respects, it was, Beresford said, you know, Clyde, you're, it's all women, but you're, you're, you're the main guy. And even you start off as the bad guy, um, we're going to see a lot of through your eyes so that you're not going to be the stereotyped enemy. And so in the course of it all, um, I was the one who was the brutal person who dispensed with brutal justice. And then through the course of it, I would listen, the women would form a uh, vocal orchestra to survive. And I would listen and follow the orders. And uh, Glenn Close was uh, the, one of the main stars, Francis McDormand. It was Kate Blanchett's first film, Jennifer Ely, uh, Juliana Margulies. It, it was a terrific cast. And there was a scene where I take Glenn after the work detail and march her into the forest. And everybody th is thinking I'm going to kill her. And then I sit her down and I sit myself opposite her. And I share this folk song in the village that I love. And... And I, the only word in English I say is, you like? And then she's, her tears coming out. She says, yes. And she didn't intend to cry. And neither did I. But it was one of those big moments that I was giving the song when I, we were in Penang, Malaysia, when we started shooting. And we were wound up in uh, 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 Port Douglas, Australia, northern Queensland, shooting the rest of the film. Because I knew it, it had to get it right. Not only get it right, but get it right honestly. And, and from the true, from a heart, you can't pretend. You really have to let that feeling and emotion be authentic. And so it worked, you know, and it, it, to, the, to this day, it's one of the films that I, I can hold in my hands. I said, well, this was a film that I really liked doing, you know. It, it's one of those, this business I've been, like I, last month in, in Australia, I'm going, wow. I mean, I had to do a 14 days of quarantine, of course, but... <laughs> The, the thing pain. was, I, I, I'm 73. I'm still get to do what I've always dreamed about doing, what uh, I've always aspired to and was inspired to. And I am still get to do that. And, and it becomes a very humbling and, and, and grateful uh, point to do that. And a lot of the things, too, is that I do believe that part of the journey is, is things happen for a reason. And... Uh, I am 
now 27 years sober after giving up the drink. And um, it's it's been a, I think it really has provided not only a foundation along with the therapy that's involved, but a foundation for health, good health. And so that people go, you're 73, they, they can't believe it, you know, and and it's, it puts you in a fine, difficult position, finding that you look younger, but then the other time is the other guy that is younger that looks older will get the part. <laughs> but that's okay, because, um, you know, I have to take a look at the journey and what I've been able to do. And it's it's been a lot. And I have to understand that, uh, not, not that I have to understand, but I understand that uh, it, it's all part of the plan. You do what is being uh, presented to you on the buffet table, right? You know, you, you don't go, yeah, I don't want that. No, no, you, you, you learn how to make the choice. And sometimes you, you make a choice that um, may work out or not, but that's part of the thing. Choice is not a guarantee, but you never know where that choice you do make may have unfold the full blossom years down the road you know it's that, that kind of a thing well congratulations by the way on your 27 years of sobriety uh, that's an amazing accomplishment too so congratulations on that and you know just to kind of uh, go back a little bit to midway again uh, i want to put yeah. some context and some perspective on this because this is uh, i think midway was 1976 when it came out so this is still fairly early on in your career yeah, and, yes you know at the time i guess your contemporaries would be guys like key luke mako who you mentioned uh the amazing james hong uh, Richard Liu, a lot of other Asian actors uh, yeah. who would also be working on a show that you did several episodes of, and that's Kung Fu. Uh, I'd love to actually ask a little bit about Kung Fu, because I'm a fan of Kung Fu. I used to watch that show growing up also, Oh. and uh, hearing that you were in it again, I was like, oh man, I gotta go back and watch those again. But, uh, you know, again, my point to ask about Kung Fu is the fact that really at that time in the mid-70s, there weren't a lot of shows for Asian actors to go to and really be themselves, uh, better or worse. Um, <clears throat> right. so I'd like to ask you know, about how your experiences were on Kung Fu uh, and if you were able to kind of like use this as a way to connect more with other Asian actors and, and maybe learn some things from them. Well, you know, it's just interesting that you mentioned it because Kung Fu, those were the days when an actor could do multiple episodes within the arc of the length of a series in different roles, different roles that yep. you weren't like identified. You can't do this or that. Today is what you're one and done. You can't because they say the audience will get confused. I don't believe they will, but that's my point. But for me, uh, Kung Fu was the first TV show that I got booked on. I was Ying Sun in this episode called Sun and Cloud Shadow in 1973, February of 73. And um, it was, I was so excited at the time and because I could put all the things that I learned at, at uh, East West Players because I was also taking coaching from an acting coach named Rick Edelstein who was a writer director. And applied, I would apply a lot of the things that were taught in creating the discipline. For example, if you only get one side, go an hour early and make be friendly with the secretary and say, could I see that script? And then quickly go through and says, where, where do you fit in and start making some choices and putting the effort, putting in the work and making the choices there, acting choices at that time. And this director, Bob Butler was uh, casting it. And Bob later on is veteran, uh, director, but he was the innovator and director behind the pilot of Hill Street Blues with the loose camera work and the constant moving camera, you know, and uh, Bob was just like no nonsense. I've been very blessed to work with a whole bunch of a plethora of wonderful directors and pioneers in many respects. So anyway, get back to Kung Fu. Um, I worked on it. I, I, in fact, I didn't have any credit. I, I, no co-starring, co nothing, you know. I was just this uncredited person, but it was a thing that exposed um, the casting people and the producers to myself and my abilities, my skill set. Because at the time, they would cast to how you looked and figure out how it sounded by putting your voice in and looping in post. You know, because at another time, my second show was called. Um, uh, was what was it called arrogant dragon which starred richard was guest starred was uh, richard lou was the guest star on it and i remember going to the audition and for a co-star part one of the two uh, henchmen to jim james hong 
And the producer looked at him, no, 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 this is the guy I'm telling you about. No, no, don't read this one, read this one. And it turned out that it was the, that was my first guest star. I was the head of the Tong that was prosecuting and going after Richard Liu's character. And I got to work with this director named Richard Lang, whose father, Walter Lang, was a big contract director at uh, 20th, did The King and I and all these other big movies. But anyway, Richard was a real filmmaker and um, respected uh, the talent and everything. And so he, we would set up a scene and then he would say, okay, Clyde, I want you to look through the viewfinder. I'm gonna have the, the stand in, follow the action that I'm gonna shoot. And the, that first shot was through the rear of a cabinet. So there's like shelves. And so he said, no, because you, can you see this? Don't worry about anything else. I'm just shooting this part of you. And thereafter, every time I worked with him, he'd say, okay, take a look at the viewfinder through the camera and see what the camera's looking at. And I wound up working on two more episodes. Another, it was, uh, the next episode I did was called uh, Blood, Blood of the Dragons where I played two characters. I played an, a hundred year old llama and the, this guy who could put his eyeballs up into the, the head and emit power. And, and we, were, we were at the audition and Richard said, I don't suppose you could put your eyes up into your head, could you? I said, you mean like that? And he just said, here's the script. And it, it was, I mean, I got to work with like Edward Albert, then his, his dad, Eddie Albert was in it and Patricia Neal, played the head matriarch on the whole thing. And it was, uh, it was a two hour uh, show. It was like a movie and, and season Hubley played the female lead. And then I wound up doing a, another episode called uh, the forbidden what, kingdom called? prisoners of prisoners of something or another, where I had a little daughter and everything. And uh, I remember doing a scene after being beaten up, and it was a British director, I forget his name right now, but he had, the, the, the big thing he had done was the, the Golden Voyage of Sinbad. Hey, so anyway- Gordon Hessler. Huh? Hessler, Gordon, Gordon Hessler. Hessler. That's right, Gordon Hessler. Hey, you you're, you got it down. Um, <laughs> I do my homework. So anyway, I'm, I'm holding on to the bars and I'm going, oh, oh. And he went, cut, are you okay? And then uh, Dicky Dova, the uh, prop guy went, oh, for Christ's sake, he's acting. So, oh, 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 okay. So, but at any rate, what I can tell you this about my experience, as you can tell, I've got all these um, memories of um, uh, Kung Fu. Um, that was like my postgraduate work. That was like my grad school. That's where I learned um, a lot. Even the camera operators would say, you're getting up too fast. And those were the days when you had dual uh, uh, cranks. And so you had to kind of, can't do the regular, you had to do it in a little slowed down way, but naturally that it likes you're going natural. But you only learn that when the camera says, please help me out here. And so you learn a little bit about camera. You learn about where, what's gonna be shot and how it's gonna go and save it for when you have to go like this, as opposed to if you're in the master or anything like that, but still be in the master so you know what you're doing because you're always working. You know, a lot of people, for example, I play. I've played a lot of judges in my 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 career, and usually, everything done in the master is shot out from the judge's point of view. And so there's a defense table, the prosecution, the jury box, the people, and everything like that. And the close up for the judge is at the end when everybody wants to go home and everybody's impatient. The other actors aren't there because they're being released because of their time. But and a lot of actors, oh, they, they wound up kvetching and, and complaining about playing a judge. But I went, no, 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 that's, that's not an appropriate way of looking at it. I looked at it, and I still look at it as this is a wonderful opportunity to have as many rehearsals as possible. So that by the time it turns around, I don't need to have those people. I can have the script supervisor read to me because I've rehearsed with the person that was really there. And so I, all I need to do is hear the words because I've already made my choices. And you've strategically put certain things so that, oh, okay, yeah, don't worry about that piece of, of line to say because it's down there. <laughs> Just, okay. You know, so that's where the element of being creative, the technique uh, of being an actor, that's what's um, invigorating. 
and that's what's the that keeps your creativity and yourself present in the creation process together you know also don't lie if you can't ride don't say i can ride because if you get on the horse and the director says okay put stop at this mark you're going ah if you can't step at the mark it always pays just to say i can't you know so they'll cut get up cut you in or whatever they'll figure something out yeah, that's a valuable oh. lesson we've learned from a lot of the stunt performers we've talked to. Don't say you've, uh, if you haven't ever been set on fire, don't say you have before. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. Because, I mean, certain things you can, I remember I had to, in a scene from Baba Black Sheep, um, sneak up on a mater Marine sentry. He turns around and I have to do this quick move to knock him out. And I rehearsed and my, myself and practiced. But at that time, you didn't practice when they had to wet down the ground and it was muddy. And you were slipped, slipped, and I made contact, and I felt really bad. And I went, and he said, "No, don't worry, man. That's my job, you know." But I really felt bad because I felt it was not professional to be able to it. But um, that's the one thing that um, a lot of stunt guys didn't care for working with David Carradine on Kung Fu, because <laughs> David would connect, you know, and they'd have to take it. So there's one scene where in Blood of the Dragon, where David as a crazed demon has to jump on me in our in a fight. I went, oh, shit, again. But when we did do the scene, he was remarkably gentle. He, he would brace himself and everything. Um, so those are some of the things, the tales. But, you know, it also Kung Fu was elemental in um, showing America at the time in the 70s that the Asians were not just these background they they could kick ass they were hard workers there was not they, they were not just victims or anything like that and it was a wow factor the fact that the lead character even though he's half but he had all these skill sets everybody went whoa throw a knife whatever you know i mean there's one scene in um, the arrogant dragon where my hen i hire a henchman he's a big guy he's six seven he's on a horseback and you'll throw hatchets at, at david and on my command, you know, and, and David would toss him away. And we were setting up one shot and I did command, like throw the hatchet. And the actor at the time, he passed away, Nathan Jung, threw the hatchet straight in the middle of my back. <laughs> and I turned around and I said, not me, him. And everybody kind of laughed. This is, and the director did say, did we get it? Because it could be on the reel, but no, it, we, we didn't get it. But it was one of those... Uh, light moments you know uh that you can can share and everything like that but that 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 was the the kung fu experiences uh it was a time it was an exciting time because uh, there was another indication uh, a little tale as I, I walked into production uh the offices at warner brothers and the casting director popped up and said there you are and he said come with me and he dragged me all the way down to the hallway and opened the door to a, a, one of the, I guess, another producer going, this is the guy I've been talking about. He can talk, you know, because like I said, <laughs> that uh, they couldn't do the dialogue. And um, at any rate, that's where I felt my, uh, the training in Northwestern was really a plus factor. Uh, today, people train like crazy, but I think that a lot of times people are underestimating the value of the training. That's why in many respects, the Brits, the Aussies, and New Zealanders um, wind up because they have like three years of professional training school before they can even get on the boards in repertory or whatever, or in front of the or have a chance to get in front of the theater, uh, the, the, the camera. And uh, even to this day, um, they were, they were this movie was being talked about. Uh, Nina Gold, the cast, famous casting director, who does almost all, every film in England was talking about casting 1917 from two or three years ago and how one young actor came in with just the one line, but he did his research about the period and everything. So he could give all for that one line, you know, that kind of a, and so that even when you have, you see what looks like background in say 1917, they're all actors. They're acting in the situation. They have no lines, but they are acting. That's why it becomes so, the canvas becomes so rich with the what you're filming and everything, as opposed to some like there. We're just there. We're 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 booking time. We're the background. That's it. No, the background works. You know, there was a time when uh, SAG actors in New York 
you could work background without any kind of uh, um, being ashamed or anything like that. It was in LA, you had this screen extras guild and they were the professional background and no actor would be caught dead doing background. And this is this whole caste system, so to speak. It's still elements of it still exist because no matter where you are in the world, background is still background and everybody goes, how can they herd people like that? Like they treat them like cattle. Um, but at a certain point you're going, well, it, it is the way of the world, so to speak. And you, all you can do is be as respectful and um, uh, understanding as possible, you know, and, and do your work, do good work, do your good job, do a good job. And because uh, you never know um, what may happen. All right. So, Clyde, another show I'm a big fan of. This is still fairly early on in your career, but you had a recurring role on All in the Family. You played Reverend Chong. Uh, you know, again, we're talking about now because this is basically towards the end of the 70s now. And I think it's a pretty breakthrough role to have like an Asian pastor on television, right? So I'd love to hear about your time on that show and also just working with that cast, working with Carol O'Connor. Oh, yeah, because um, at the time, the um, uh, the assistant director or stage manager was a, a Japanese-American guy named Gary Shimokawa. And um, he um, was telling me later on that people, I got cast as the Reverend Chong, and people were like uh, a little kind of on pins and needles, you know, because we even had a, a veteran actors like Jack Guilford out of New York, when they were <clears throat> when they worked with Carol, were really like uh, intimidated and like um, flabbergasted or whatever, and so I just approached it as okay, we'll do it like a, a, a theater, just because what they did was they shot the show at that time for a half hour, four camera, video where they only had an afternoon show on Friday and an evening show. And you went straight through, there was no cut pickups or anything to get it right. You just ran it like a show. So the, the moral imperative and professional imperative was don't fuck up, just do it, do your performance, get it really done. So um, people weren't sure until we did the first show, the afternoon show. And then you get together for a meal and notes and everything. And I'm sitting there and it was like um, one table with Norman and everybody and then the writers and then I'm at the other end with the cast. Norman sat down, he saw me and he popped up and rushed over to my side and came up to me and said, you're funny. And that was it, you know, because <laughs> as he's way back, you could see everybody going, oh, they just like let out uh, 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 their, their, their tension, they just let out. And then we did a good show that night. And the important thing was the threes in comedy, Ching, Chang, Chong, whatever. And so that was like, whatever, Mr. Binker, Bunker, whatever. So you just follow those guiding lights of comedy and just be professional about it, you know, and it worked. And, and it hit so that when they did um, the show that the Stivics moved to the West and they left the show, Rob and uh, Gloria, I, I renewed the vows for the both Archie and Edith and Meathead and, and Gloria. And there were a lot of people. It was like a really heady time because it was so historic that this, they were leaving the cast. So you had people like Carl Reiner and people like that. And I never saw Rob Reiner so nervous, like a kid. Just going, oh, I hope I don't fuck up. I hope I don't fuck up. So it was like, what am I to be to to be nervous about and then we did um stephanie's conversion where the new cast member stephanie turns out to be jewish and not episcopal <laughs> and so later on they were doing a, a movie called oh god and carl reiner was a director on it and so i was called in to meet the casting director a small one line part grocery clerk and at warner brothers and then carl reiner walked by the the office open office door and he was like, hey, hi. And he, he walked by. And then a second later, he popped back in and says, you're funny. <laughs> and that was it. And I wound up getting cast by him in Oh God to work with John Denver. So, you know, these are the kind of moments, like I said, you don't, you can't understand it, but then there are connections being made. And so, um, so when Colucci called me to just interview me about it, I just 
uh, told him all the different stories about shooting it. And that's for the uh, how, uh, book I did get an thing. opportunity uh, a couple of years ago. Um, Norman had a show called uh, Guess Who Died? And a couple of years before that, he was doing a, a foundation uh, conversation for the SAG After Foundation. And I happened to be one of the uh, moderators. And um, I said, You still working? And he says, Oh, yeah, we got a show where. He says, one of the ideas, because, you know, if it takes place in an old age home and everybody says, guess who died? <laughs> <laughs> it was a very funny concept. It just didn't work when they finally did it. But I did get a chance to audition for him. And um, the guy, Peter Tolman, was his co-exec producer. And so I just was saying, hey, this is what happened. We worked together before, and I really appreciate your, your it was like a touch of knighthood when you said that. And Tolman just shot out what were you 10 at the time <laughs> and uh, it was like it makes for a good uh conversation and so and then gary was telling me later on says oh yeah no 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 everybody just was like wow because you really hit it out of the park you know every and and then later on I mean, you know when i run into carol it was like hi how are you it almost is reminiscent that um when taxi was being cast I was sent in and I read for Bobby, the actor part. And um, I didn't get it, but I wound up being invited to be a guest on the first show that they did. And then years later, Gary said, because his wife, Rhonda Young, was a casting director at Paramount. And he said, he said Clyde, you don't know how close you were, did you? I said, close to what? They wanted to have you cast, but the network kind of got cold feet because Asian, whatever, that type of thing. So they went the direction that they did go in. I said, oh, oh so oh, no wonder there's a kind of a special friendliness of uh, inviting for it. Yeah, of course. And there are many kind of stories like that. Like um, I was up for Quincy with Jack Klugman. And uh, it was one of those things where up at Universal, I'd go to the room, I was very loose and Jack and I were reading Said, ah, okay, thanks. Thanks very much. And I left. And just as I hit the elevator, the casting director comes running down the hall. He said, can you come back, please? Can you come back and do some more reading? And this was like on a Thursday or Friday morning. And I went back and said, oh, yeah, this is great. You know, Clark was going, yeah, this is great. You do this, you do that. And they other hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I didn't hear anything, you know. And then Months later, I'm having lunch with Mako, and he, Mako said, you don't know, you don't realize, do you, this story? I said, what story? He says, as far as Jack Klugman knew, you were going to be there Monday when they started shooting. But Bob Ito was one of the last people seen, and there was nobody else there except for the exact producer, um, whose name escapes me right now, Glenn Larson. Glenn, Glenn, it was only Glenn Larson. And Bob and Glenn went, okay, you're it. And, and for like the seven years, Jack used it sort of like, now don't fuck up now. We got a guy who, who was close to getting this role, you know, it's, even in humor and everything like that. But at the time I was doing the choir boys. So I said, oh, well, that's, that's a good story. But it was one of those examples is things happen for a reason, right? If I had gotten that, I wouldn't have been able to get the choir boys and work with Bob Aldrich. You know, it's sort of like Selleck was wanted for Raiders of the Lost Ark, but he had to sit down, wait for production on Magnum to start going. So it could have been all these things, what could have happened. So that that's the the um, coincidence kind of a thing. Throughout your career, you have a ton of connections in your work to other Star Trek people or Star Trek actors, whatever. I mean, there's a whole bunch. We're not, I don't even think we're going to really be able to talk about voiceover stuff today because I know you've crossed paths with Brent Spiner and Michael Dorn. But uh, in terms of Star Trek connections on screen, you actually were in a film called Volunteers. That's a Tom Hanks and John Candy vehicle that was directed by Nicholas Meyer. And uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if you know, Clyde, he, he wrote and directed Star Trek 2 and 6, and he yes. uh, wrote 4. Um, but yeah, in particular, I would really love to hear about working with John Candy. I love John Candy stories. <clears throat> uh, and uh, by the way, too, I should mention this movie also has Professor Toru Tanaka. So if you've got any stories about him, uh, I'm all ears. But uh, yeah, you got a hilarious scene with John Candy. I'd love to know what you remember from being on that set. Oh, well, if you mention Toru Tanaka, Toru played my henchman in, in Shanghai Surprise. And Brent and I did um, a, a pilot with Jim Neighbors called Sprayberry in Paradise. 
with uh, Courtney Cox it was her first half hour of sitcom that she ever did. Um, and, and Michael Dorn, of course, doing voiceover work with him in car various cartoons. But uh, doing um, volunteers was uh, really, was really great. It was very fun. Um, we would, before we started shooting, we did a week of rehearsals in LA uh, at a place called the Baby Lion in Koreatown. And Hanks was this great guy. He's he, not was, I mean, he's a great guy, very authentic and everything. In fact, we're hitting the parking lot and I heard this dee, 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 and it was a Vanagon and it was Tom going, hey, like that. And then we were rehearsed and then Nick Meyer was a very kind of um, flamboyant director, so to speak, writer with set um, ideas and set ways. So when we came to the scene with uh, John and I, uh, as he as Tom Tuttle, I just captured him, and then it becomes Tom Tuttle Tacoma. You will be raped, brainwashed, and then he becomes brainwashed and everything. <laughs> and it's, uh, Nick said, "No, no, no, no. We're gonna do this, th th this." And then John just looked at me like, "Okay." Then when we got to Mexico, Tuxtepec, Mexico, John took me aside and says, "Dude, we're gonna work every spare moment. We're gonna rehearse the scene." We just gonna run this fucking scene, just run the fucking scene. <laughs> and we did. We, you know, said da, 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 da. and John was terrific to work with. You know, he was on a diet and his trailer was stuffed at that time, it was called Pritikin diet and everything like that. But he'd always go, hey, let's have some Papa's Freaks or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and and watch the Super Bowl. I got a TV set, and it, but it's all in Spanish. Ah, who the fuck cares? We all know it's football. We're making noise anyway. And so we get down to the falls of Caramaco which was further south than Tuxtepec. And all of a sudden it was like, whoa, this is a totally, Tuxtepec was this dusty place. You know, it was like the, where the transverse for the, the marijuana trade went through Tuxtepec in a way, in East Oaxaca. But anyway, down in, in Caramaco, the falls, glorious falls and everything. In fact, that was a location in the librarian that they used as well. So <clears throat> we're there. We're in costume and everything. And Nick says, okay, got a big cigar. Let's rehearse. And I says, uh, okay, I'm going to do it. And then John said, Nick, please, will you let us show you something that we've been working on? Okay, 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 go ahead, go ahead. So he and I, John and I did what basically you see that was filmed. <laughs> <laughs> After we finished, the crew was hysterical. They laughed. And everything, and there was a, Nick Meyer took a pause and went, yeah, it works. Fuck it. Reset. <laughs> and that's what John was smart enough to present it, his idea without butting heads with Nick, you know. And uh, so it, it was that was that's my Nick story. And years later, um, Chris Candy it became good friends with my youngest son through some other way. But. I was I was able to show uh, present Chris with a kind of a Polaroid wardrobe shot that we took together, which he liked. But um, John was uh, John was one of a kind, a bear. I mean, the last time I saw John was at a restaurant in Vancouver. I think it was just before he went down to Mexico, and then of course he passed away with a massive heart attack and everything. But at that time, John had ballooned largely, larger than he was during um, uh, volunteers. But, you know, it was great, uh, Rita and Tom. And even to this day, um, the, the last in-person SAG Awards, so it must have been two years ago, uh, Rita and, uh, and, and Tom were there. And uh, I'm also a member of the, the, uh, the SAG After Foundation. And there's a big bottle at the entrance where we have all the celebrities sign it, which we can auction off. And Tom and Rita came up and Rita went, oh, my God, we're having a volunteers reunion here. You know, and it was just like a wonderful thing. And Tom is one of these, hey, Clyde, you know, and I wound up working with Tom month, uh, uh, further down the line on Turner and Hooch way back, which was another story in itself, too, because it was... Um, I had to give up doing Bird on a Wire because Bird on a Wire was maybe a couple of days up in Vancouver and Turner and Hooch was like a week. But when I got to Monterey, I'm my scene was the cover, cover set. And sure enough, as fates allow, 
after the second day of shooting up in Monterey, it rained and rained. So I got called to the, the big show. And it was like, okay, Clyde, we need a name. And I thought, what, what would your character's name be? I said, well, my firstborn is named Kevin. Okay, it's Kevin. Kevin's going to be it. So when you see Turner and Hooch is, hey, Kevin, how are you? You know, that is. And then after we wrapped, I'm going, huh, I wonder, since I'm done, I'm available. I wonder if they cast Bird on a the Wire then. And those are the days when there was no such thing as cell phones or anything like that. You know, this is like 88, 89 or whatever, around that time. So Tom went, hey, what's up? I said, well, I'm trying to find out if my, but I don't have a phone. I said, come in, come in, use my phone. And I called my agents down, down in LA and I said, uh, hey, I, I'm wrapped. Bird on a wire still available? And they got back to me and said, yeah, you're doing it. And I went, oh, that's wonderful. You know, that's great because it was an opportunity to work with, with Mel Gibson uh, because he was doing a project called Air America down the line that Roger Spottiswood, who directed Turner and Hooch, directed, was going to direct, and who one of the reasons I wanted to do Turner and Hooch was to get to work with Roger. And even though I had to go down to Palos Verdes a couple of times because there was a mis, mis screw up in the scheduling, uh, Roger said, you know, it's only a one line part. One scene part. I said, well, but you know, it's sort of like uh, the guy who did uh, played Serge in uh, Beverly Hills Cop. It was like only two lines, like, would you like some coffee? That type of thing. And Bronson Pinchot. And Bronson Pinchot wound up starring in Perfect Strangers. I didn't want to say because you're going to direct Air America. <laughs> so then when it came time to work for Air America, I auditioned and uh, it was great. I mean, I have, Robert Downey Jr. there, and everybody was excited. This was like on a Thursday, maybe, or Wednesday. And Roger said to the casting people, um, let's, let's book them. And they said, nah, we got time. What's going to happen between now and Monday? Well, what happened between then and Monday was I get a call from my agent going, how would you like to go to Hawaii? work with Richard Chamberlain, you've already got approval from the studio and CBS has given the network approval. You don't even have to read for them. We just have to do the deal. Yes, of course. So we're waiting on the deal and I'm doing Murder, She Wrote and we're on location way in Canyon country where there's no phone service. You know, and, and so Monday comes around. I get a call from Roger Spotters which says, hello, I suppose you're not gonna be able to give up 13 episodes, are you, to do this movie? And I went, no, I'm sorry, Roger, I can't. But they, they attempted to get me to do it. It says, well, you're gonna be closers in Hawaii to, to Thailand where they were shooting. And it just so happened that Billy McNamara, who was also in our cast, was doing Texasville. And there was all these logistical problems that they didn't wanna deal with me. So as a result, they wound up casting Bert Kwok, who was a British, Asian British actor to play the character. And uh, so that's one of the stories of why you do something when somebody says, oh, well, why'd you take a small part? I can share it now because at the time it seemed was too calculating. <laughs> and, <laughs> but at the same time though, it points out that you really have to be at that time really scrounging around saying, what are the next projects coming up? And where can I get to be fit in? Where can I fit into this, this thing? So you wound up doing extra footwork, so to speak, even then your agents were quite aware of, and it, it just different kind of motivation. And so if we're talking about volunteers, that's the great story about that is that it still holds up. That scene still holds up. Every once in a while, you see it being talked about on Twitter or whatever, and people talk about it as like, boy, it's still funny after all those years. You know, it's a lot of years go by. That's a wrap for part one, but stay tuned next week for part two of this interview with Clyde to hear stories from the set of Star Trek The Next Generation, working with William Shatner, being directed by Patrick Stewart and Jonathan Frakes, and a whole lot more non-Trek tales too in this epic chat. That's it for this week's episode of Trek Untold. Until next time, please don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you're in a position to financially support the show, please consider becoming a supporter over on patreon.com slash trekuntold or pick up some merchandise from our Redbubble store. If you're looking for direct links for any of these things, links will be right in the show notes. 
Special thanks to Scott Ray for providing us with this week's guest. If you'd like to book them for an autograph signing or convention appearance, email Scott at scottray67 at aol.com. If you have any questions or comments for the show, or would like to suggest a guest, or discuss any sponsorship ideas with us, send me a message at trekuntold at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to Trek Untold and for continuing to support this show. I hope you'll come back next time to learn more stories about Star Trek and beyond. Until then, I'm Matthew Kaplowitz, and always remember, fortune favors the bold. Trek Untold is sponsored by treksphere.com. Promoting fan-produced Star Trek content in all forms is powered by the RageWorks Podcasting Network and is affiliated with Nerd News Today.